Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week we have a range of news items, some more interesting such as Finland's education policy focusing on critical thinking and evidence-based research, organic farming and the relationship it has with genetically modified crops, how allergies might be treated, at least mild allergies, with a relatively simple patch, similar to nicotine patches, why the uh, resistance to the availability of Narcan is really not a good idea, the bizarre fact that chiropractors as a community have pushed back against other chiropractors' claims that it can improve immunity, bizarre behavior from giraffes, the uh, Supreme Court case that looks at legalizing weapons, and a uh, physics problem that appears to contradict Einstein's concept of local causality. You'll find the timestamps for these and other news items in the description box below. Let's start with Finland and how their education fundamentally focuses on two aspects. The first is simply that students should have critical thinking skills from the very start of their education, that is, if they are presented with information, can they look at that information and judge its veracity, its quality, and then make an informed decision about it. The second is, can those same students go and do their own research and establish whether or not the information that they have access to and the information that they've been provided can corroborate each other, and based on their critical thinking skills, are they being misled by one or the other, or is there somewhere in between that is the truth? Finland's focus is that this education begins in primary schools, and that's the perfect place to start. In fact, arguably, it should start even earlier with fairy tales. For example, Little Red Riding Hood, and the idea that she has to critically think about what the wolf is presenting as when it tries to pretend to be her grandmother. That is a perfect example of critical thinking. There are facts which contradict what is being claimed, therefore, is what is being claimed true? And in the case of the fairy tale, it ends up saving her life. With the already availability of information on the internet and social media as a particular example, critical thinking is ever more important. In the early days of formal education, particularly focusing on the early part of the 20th century, much of the information was limited. You would have to rely on books in libraries, experts such as teachers or lecturers, and similar to be able to get knowledge. Today, with anybody able to share whatever they want on the internet, and yes, we recognize the irony of that, there is very little limitation on what people can be exposed to. By itself, what Finland's doing is impressive, and it should be part of standard education, even if it's not. What Finland's doing that is impressive is the step they take beyond this. Specifically, that they're focusing on statistics, and how statistics can be, well, to use the expression, lies, damned lies, and statistics. They can be twisted and distorted if you don't have the ability to evaluate them. In this case, the project is not just focusing on the critical thinking and the ability to do research along with statistics, it's developing what they call social resilience. That being that their society is far less let's say, vulnerable to misinformation and deception as a result. Going across to uh, agricultural news, and at least slightly more interesting and less serious, the Japanese farmer, who through several somewhat difficult steps, is able to provide mangoes throughout winter that sell for more than $230. Dollars. Yes, one mango for $230. Dollars. The idea with this is reasonably simple. In order to ensure that the mango trees delay their flowering and then fruiting, they're kept cold by snow that's been stored. This snow is then melted down and it allows the tree to undergo the flowering process just before winter hits. And by doing this, the mangoes then ripen into winter, allowing them to be sold throughout the coldest period when they otherwise would not be available. 
the challenge with trying to do this over winter is that you need a heat source, and to be quite blunt, trying to heat greenhouses in which you are storing mango trees would be a very expensive exercise and they will be selling for far more than $230 if done with electricity or other consumable energy sources like that. In order to mitigate this, the farm is going one step further than using the naturally occurring snow. Instead, they're using hot springs to generate the heat for the greenhouses, and this is what lets them grow the mangoes throughout winter. The reality is that trying to do that really does go against nature, and it's not efficient. It does work, but efficiency drops drastically, which is why they cost so much on an individual basis. This is also why organic farming is not a good idea. However, the Euractive publication has an interesting take on this that looks at the possibility of using gene editing to compensate for organic farming's limitations. The simple reality is that at best, organic farming is 80% efficient compared to conventional farming methods. This means that you get less yield per square meter of land, or roughly 3 feet. In order to make up for this, you need to get more out of each unit of land. Genetic modification could do this. It would allow for better production despite the fact that they don't use things like synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides. This is where we might see an interesting development in Europe, and specifically the European Commission may look at approving more genetically modified crops. Overall, there's practically nothing allowed in Europe that's genetically modified. They have been very reticent to approve it. But based on their push towards greater organic farming, approximately 25% by 2030, it seems that they will have to go down this pathway if they want to continue it. In clinically relevant news, there's a new blood clotting system that could help drastically with major hemorrhage. Think of things like bullet shot wounds, aneurysms, or other internal bleeding. The reality is, blood clotting is the body's first line of defense when it comes to hemorrhage. It's meant to plug any hole in major arteries, capillary beds, and similar, thereby preventing blood from leaking out of the vascular system where it needs to be to move oxygen, nutrients, and remove waste. Unfortunately, this system is not necessarily perfect, especially for large-scale injuries. After all, in evolutionary terms, Someone who had that kind of injury would have been long since dead before clotting could really do its job. Thankfully, modern medicine interventions have extended the time frame for someone to be treated like that. For example, getting blood transfusions means the huge blood loss is mitigated to an extent. The challenge for those individuals is not the blood loss itself, but getting the clotting to take effect in time for them to be able to, well, be treated in the somewhat longer term. This is where the uh, new system is useful. It has two components in it, and these two components fundamentally match to existing things within the blood, primarily the clotting factors known as fibrinogen and these cell fragments that would help to activate them. By having uh, these two systems or two parts of the system in place, you can more effectively and more quickly clot blood. It is worth us pointing out that this has only been tested in animal models, so take that how you will. The basic idea is that one part of the system works with the platelets specifically, but there's only so many platelets circulating in the body at a given time, and so while you will deliver them to the site of injury, you will eventually run out. This is where the second product becomes important. It's a polymer that acts to help fill in the gap where you run out of platelets but you need to keep clotting the injury site. This second product plays the role of fibrinogen, and the fibrinogen is what normally creates a lot of the clotting in that area. It's part of the clotting cycle. Platelets initiate the site's protection, fibrinogen finishes it off. Acute care is one consideration, but chronic conditions are another, and to some extent, chronic conditions are more of a drain on the healthcare system. That's because they require constant monitoring and treatment. Allergies are something that bridges both chronic and acute. People have to be chronically aware of it and generally take steps to try and avoid the allergy from happening. The acute instances are when they are exposed. 
and particularly for children, nut allergies are a big worry. That's why the that is where a skin patch that somehow mitigates the effect of peanut allergies, at least at a very low level, appears to be very promising. Although again, be aware, this is clinical trial research, even if it is late stage, it is clinical trial, and as a result, this may fail spectacularly at the last minute. There's something like someone falling over at the end of a race before getting to the finishing line. After 12 months of following children, specifically toddlers, Given the patch, they found that they could experience mild exposure, that is a small number of peanuts, without any kind of allergic reaction. By itself, that sounds really promising, but the details are where we need to look at. Two thirds of the children involved, and there were only a couple of hundred children involved in this study, became desensitized. The 118 children who didn't appear to have outgrown their allergies. So we have both a complication in that the data is not complete because a large portion of the kids didn't have the condition at the end, and two-thirds who did react as intended. To be very clear about this, the idea of a patch is much better than oral medication because oral medication is generally a very high dose that the body clears within about a day. By using a patch, you get constant release of a very low level of the drug into the body. This therefore prevents issues about medication complexities because you're not talking about huge doses. It's a much smaller dose. Further clinical news, but this time that is both the same but also stupid. One hospital director has described sex change clinics as being no different than treating kids for diabetes. Yes, there are some similarities between them. Those similarities basically boil down to the use of hormones. You use insulin to treat type 1 diabetes and insulin resistant type 2 diabetes. You use androgen blockers and then later on other hormones for sex change or gender dysphoria. That's where the two similarities end, the fact that hormones are used for both. Diabetes, at least at this stage, doesn't involve any kind of surgical intervention and doesn't necessarily require counselling or other psychological support. To be very clear about it, the risks from insulin are present, particularly if you somehow inadvertently overdose on insulin. That can cause hyperglycemia, that is a lack of blood sugar which can cause effects in the body. This is very easily reversed by the provision of something glucose-rich, like lollies. However, hormone therapy and later on surgical interventions are not so easily reversed. To an extent, hormone therapy can be reversed, although it takes time. The surgical interventions, not so much. And in the case of something like a hysterectomy, or as it's also known, bottom surgery, no, you really can't. Once the reproductive system is removed, it's gone, plain and simple. To be blunt, this is a terrible take. Yes, normalizing people who want to transition is perfectly understandable, but trying to compare it to a different pathology and a different treatment process that involves far more steps and very different treatment is simply misinformation. In other misinformation news, we have the pushback against the approval of Narcan. Narcan is used for opioid overdoses, and recently it was allowed to be given as an over-the-counter medication. Previously, you had to have a prescription for it, and this not only added to cost for a physician's appointment, the prescription itself, and all of the associated costs such as pharmacy operations. By having this as over-the-counter medication, that's been removed as a problem. The issue is, people are pushing back against it, arguing that it really only increases use of it by making it less of a problem to take. Given that more than 70,000 Americans die each year from opioid overdoses, having it readily available doesn't seem like a bad idea, since people dying, and people who are dying that could be prevented from dying, is generally frowned upon. It would be fair to hope that somebody who experiences an overdose and 
thankfully survives through the use of Narcan, or Naloxone as it's also called, would mean that they're more likely to go into therapy and hopefully rehabilitation to no longer have their addiction. While this is a hopeful outlook and may not necessarily reflect reality, it is what you would hope to see, and yes, it is an entirely optimistic outlook, which is rare enough. Even if that doesn't happen, people dying from drug overdoses still carries its own cost, and this is why the only real support for why it's a bad idea, that being an economic study from many years ago, was not exactly a good basis. Many of the people who would overdose may not be productive members of society, while others would be. Simply giving them all the same label and treating them all the same way isn't really effective when there is a viable productive solution to this situation. Shifting to clinical news that isn't useful. It is a chiropractor who taps you with a hammer to remove pain in your neck. Chiropractors. This is the red-headed stepchild of medical practices in that it has no foundation, no relationship to medical practice, and is ultimately just a giant scam, and this instance more so than any other. If we were to compare it to any sort of therapy, therapy used very loosely, it's very similar to something like cupping or acupuncture. The difference is that there's no uh, historical cultural basis for it. This is simply somebody who found some interesting items on eBay and thought this would be a great thing to sell to people as a new treatment. There's also the uh, other interesting devices used in the video in question. To be quite blunt, there appears to be no obvious clinical evidence to support its use, there's no supporting data, and in the end, as said, this does appear to be nothing more than deceptive if not scamful marketing. In other chiropractor related news, but this time surprisingly positive news, there has been a very clear publication from the global chiropractic research community that says chiropractic practices do nothing to boost your immunity, which should be surprising to no one. The fundamental basis of chiropractic is that your spine alignment is what's going to dictate your health, and this then will have benefits for you if your spine is properly aligned. No, that's not what's going to affect it, and more so for immunity. The immune system is fundamentally premised on three things. One, that you have the ability to produce the leukocytes involved, and these come from bone marrow. Two, that you have the ability to remember what you've been exposed to, and this is the adaptive immune system element. The adaptive immune system is what makes antibodies and cells specifically suited to dealing with particular kinds of pathogens, or tumors and other things that the immune system will recognize as not being good. The other is the leukocytes and other similar systems involved in your first line of defense and your second line of defense. These two are your innate immune system. These are the parts of the immune system that can deal with anything and everything that you encounter, but not very well. So where you have the specialized immune system, which is your adaptive, and your all-purpose innate immune system, they work together one delaying it so the other one has time to act. Aligning your spine does nothing for any of this, and so it's amazing that chiropractors were, and more than likely still are, making claims that what they do will boost immunity. The fact that the chiropractic research community has begun to push back against it is obvious indications that they received a lot of issues from it. In an example of immune systems that work as intended and evidence-based treatment, we have a uh, very early result for pancreatic cancer. In this case, the way it works is that you receive a vaccine. That vaccine contains the necessary antigens for the immune system to recognize the pancreatic cancer cells in your body. These Antigens are taken to the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell then provides it to B and T cells. 
The T cells here are the more important example. T cells specialize in certain roles. One of those roles is killing your own cells that are behaving abnormally. In other words, cancer. This clinical trial, and understand it is a very early clinical trial, found that those who were given the vaccine had much better health outcomes and had quantifiably more presence of the appropriate T cells based on the vaccine that was administered. It is worth us saying that this is early trial data and that nobody involved survived over the long term. So there's no recurrent free period, which is unfortunate, but given the very early nature of this study, it's promising. But then again, so are many other early studies. So take this as a interesting bit of clinical news, but not necessarily anything promising about what will happen. The only important thing to note here is that this is a very easily modified vaccine because it is based on mRNA, which means that they could theoretically be able to take tumors from anybody who has pancreatic cancer of the kind that was treated here and create customized vaccines for each individual. Shifting from clinical news to animal news and the bizarre observation about small brain giraffes. Yes, that's what they're called. In this case, they're able to do some statistical analyses. That is, they know that if you have so many foods available and how to use those foods appropriately to get the most out of them. The study itself is somewhat questionable, but the gist of it is that the researchers had two containers, one with zucchini and carrot, one with just carrot. The giraffes were able to figure out that if the researchers took something out of each container in one hand each and offered them both hands, they could reliably choose the hand that was far more likely to contain carrot. This of course isn't a perfect way of conducting the research as things like the smell of food may be confounding variables. This is why the researchers used three different approaches. One was the container with much zucchini and little carrot, and another container with lots of carrot. The second was that the container had equal amounts of carrot and zucchini, and the other container had lots of carrot. The final container had very little zucchini, lots of carrot, and the other container had only carrot again. This meant that as long as they chose the container that only had carrot in it, they were more likely to get that. And this is why they believe that the giraffes were able to figure it out. As we said, this study isn't exactly perfect, but However, it may or may not support what they're claiming, but certainly more research would be required to establish whether or not that's true. In an example of stupid news, we have an article from the New York Times, and fundamentally, a woman wrote about the grief she experienced after her husband died. And this is great, um, fundamentally explaining how you dealt with it, and then writing a book as they did to help children deal with grief is laudable. That is, except in this case, because it appears that she's been charged with poisoning her husband, thereby killing him, with a lethal dose of fentanyl. Yes, the very actions for which she was praised may have been predicated on her committing murder. Yeah. This is why you don't try and achieve fame based on doing something dangerous, dumb, or illegal. Next we shift to a, another legal matter, and the uh, other interesting development in America, but particularly on the fact that SCOTUS may be looking at a case that would legalize assault weapons. Be very clear, assault weapons has no meaning. It's a term that doesn't have a definition. What this court case may look at doing is removing the ban on AR-15s and similar weapons, but specifically talking about rifles. Rifles that have a magazine and pretty much anything that was bought post 
the 1980s from memory is a semi-automatic weapon. If it was bought before the 1980s law came into effect, then it may be automatic or semi-automatic. The reason that the uh, lawsuit's being brought before SCOTUS is that Illinois brought in a new law which fundamentally targets semi-automatic rifles like the AR-15 and others that have what are called large capacity magazines or as the law calls it large capacity ammunition feeding devices. This is any rifle that holds more than 10 rounds of ammunition or a handgun with more than 15. While if you ignore some of the uh, more obvious bias in the article from Vox, there is some interesting content to this. It's the implications that they do point out for a national result that are important. Notably, that if SCOTUS does take on this case and finds that the law is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, it would mean that no state in America would be allowed to ban what are considered in the, this law high capacity magazines. Places like California would be particularly affected by this where they have some very sweeping and strict gun laws. Although Vox spends a great deal of time harping on about the uh, possibility that laws could be overturned or prior case law from inferior courts well, could be changed, they do point out that just about all of the justices do believe that dangerous and unusual weapons should remain restricted, and that that restriction would ban or at least control things like machine guns, fully automatic rifles, and similar. This matter has yet to actually be formally accepted by SCOTUS, and that's simply because all we know is that it's on their shadow docket, the shadow docket being a list of emergency motions that have been requested of them, but that they've yet to make a decision on. This means they may still reject the application for intervention by the plaintiffs, instead choosing to either wait on the system to work its way through, that is the current court case, the appeals, the state level, and then eventually SCOTUS, or they may choose to deny it entirely. Shifting to a unrelated but similar topic, that is a interesting article by Charles Oppenheimer. Charles Oppenheimer being the family member of Robert Oppenheimer, one of the creators of nuclear weapons, at least nuclear weapons as we know them, fat boy and little man, that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These two weapons ended World War II. Importantly, the article is not so much about the idea of these weapons, but that nuclear energy should be embraced more readily by people. They point out that there is a certain perception of relationship between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, although it is worth pointing out that the fuel used in a nuclear reactor is generally only enriched to about 5% whereas nuclear weapon enrichment is closer to 100%. The two big downsides to nuclear energy are that the facilities take a very long time to build and are very expensive. The reason for that, at least that increased expense compared to other energy sources, is that there is a lot more regulatory frameworks, approvals and difficulties around getting these facilities up and running compared to something like a coal-powered plant. The second is the waste products of nuclear energy production, that is, where and how do you store spent uranium? There are some countries that have tried developing frameworks in which to store spent uranium, but these frameworks have had big issues where what they were predicting would be capacity for years turns out to not be anywhere near enough. As a result, any increase in nuclear power would have to have a commensurate increase in funding for disposal of this nuclear material. The final news we have for you relates to Einstein's concept of local causality and that we may have proof that he was wrong about at least this. The fundamental idea is that if you have two molecules separated, that there is some causality between them, that is, some interaction in what they're doing. 
in order to test this, there was a thought experiment going all the way back to the 1960s. That thought experiment has now been put into practice and is a real experiment in physics. The gist of this is that you have two particles, and if you measure them at the same time and check it against a value called Bell's inequality, you'll find that if Einstein was correct, they would satisfy Bell's inequality. If they don't, then you have quantum mechanics being at play. The results of this experiment, and to be very clear, it's complicated and involves a ridiculously difficult setup, has been satisfied. Therefore, it would appear Einstein is wrong, and that quantum mechanics does indeed violate at least that local causality theory. In short, it involved a 30 meter long tube with two circuits at each end, and that these circuits would send a microwave from one to the other to get the two connected in the way that was needed for this experiment. At the end of this, they were able to get at thousands and thousands of measurements, if not millions, and in doing so, they could say with statistical certainty, which is the nicer way of saying we can't find anything that's wrong with our results, that quantum mechanics explains what we're observing, not local causality as Einstein expected it to be. The results, however, as said, required extremely complex systems, extremely extravagant setups, and have been developed over a period of about 90 years, with the initial debate starting in the 1930s, the theoretical thought experiment in the 60s, in the 70s experiments that were practical, and only now in the 2020s are we seeing that there's actual results that can be measured, or at least results can be measured without any loopholes. But that's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.